Okay, hello. Today we're going to talk about electrolytes versus non-electrolytes. So um, to, to cover this to begin with, we need to talk about what an electrolyte is and what it would take to be a, a non-electrolyte. Um, this was one of your vocabulary words, and so you should have, have been able to figure this one out fairly quickly. Um, and just a second. Um, electrolytes are substances that conduct electricity when dissolved in water, okay? Now, electrolytes can also conduct electricity when they're melted, when they're in their molten state. So, um, electrolytes are basically things that conduct electricity, um, which makes, of course, non-electrolytes are substances that don't conduct electricity. So, that's fairly straightforward, but we need to talk about what it means to conduct electricity and why an electrolyte would and non-electrolytes don't. So, what is the major difference here that causes them to be able to conduct electricity or not. So um, to take a look at what electricity is, remember that um, electricity is simply the flowing of electrons from, and if you have electrons and electrons are flowing, okay, So I need to start over real quick. My microphone fell. Um, so if we have if, if we have an understanding of what electricity is, we know that electrons flow, and this is just the flow of electrons, which is why it's called electricity. Um, and electrons flow from an area of high potential, high potential to low potential. Okay, so it's the same thing as diffusion. It's simply the diffusion of electrons. For those of you who are in physics, this should really be a review because you learned about electricity. For those of you who are have not had your physics yet, then this consider this a preview. So the flow of electrons from high potential to low potential. Now, um, if you have a substance, so say we're gonna give ourselves a beaker of a substance here. We have a beaker of our substance and if we are going to take a look at whether electrons are going to flow through it, there needs to be charges that are free to move to carry those electrons through the substance itself. Now if we look back to our example from our previous video, we can see that if we were to dissolve say salt, Okay, remember our salt dissolves into little positive ions and little negative ions or big negative ions. And so we have all of these charges that are free to move about in the water. And the reason that is so is because that they are all surrounded by water molecules. Okay, again, a review from yesterday, if, if we take a look at all of the water molecules that are surrounding these guys, Okay, so these guys are surrounded by water, but they're free to move about. They're not bound in a crystal structure. Okay, so we surround these guys with water molecules. So they're moving, and they can move anywhere in this bowl of water. Um, and so if it's salt water, they can move throughout the water um, as sodium and chlorine ions. So we have our sodium ions and our chlorine ions. Now, if we were to stick an electrical probe, okay, say we stick a positive, which is a cathode, and then we stick a negative anode on the other side, then the electrons, of course, flow from the negative side to the positive side, and these electrons are able to flow and move freely throughout this, so this would be an electrolyte. Um, Again, electrolytes need those free charges to be able to move through the substance. And so when you have an ionic compound that is soluble, meaning that it does dissolve so that those ions are free to move about, then you're going to have electrolytes. You're going to have something that can conduct electricity. Now, um, by contrast, if we come over here and take a look at a substance that is like salt but not soluble, then, so we have an ionic compound, but it's bound together. It's not separated. The water hasn't come in and pulled those ions apart. So we have here an insoluble ionic compound, okay? Well, if those ions aren't moving around in the water, then it doesn't matter what, um, if, if you attach a positive and a 
sorry, I need to make that a negative. Um, if you have a positive and a negative um, charge connected to that solution, connected to that water, then you have this insoluble ionic compound. None of those charges are going to be able to move because they're all bound together in this crystal. Um, and so therefore this would be a non-electrolyte, okay? Because those um, ions are not able to move around. Now, um, likewise, if you imagine, you'll notice that we've only talked about ionic compounds here. And if it's an ionic and soluble, it is an electrolyte. However, if it's ionic and it's insoluble, it's not an electrolyte. So we haven't talked, well, the one we haven't talked about is covalent compounds, okay? Now remember, covalent compounds are bound together. These are compounds like water, okay, where you have oxygen and hydrogen. Now these guys are not going to come apart when you dissolve them. And it doesn't mean that they're insoluble. It simply means they're not going to form ions in a solution. So if there's no ions, there's no charge. And no ions and no charge means no electrolytes, right? So these guys can't conduct electricity. But Ms. Carr, you say, I know that water and electricity don't mix. And so if I put a charge into water, it's going to conduct. Well, that's true to a certain extent. If you do that with tap water, it absolutely will. But the problem with tap water isn't that it's H2O and that that conducts electricity because honestly, pure H2O doesn't conduct electricity. Um, at least not very well. It is a polar molecule, so it will conduct some. However, it is not an electrolyte. It does not easily conduct electricity because there are no ions in it. But if you think about our tap water, our tap water has tons of minerals and additives and ions and dissolved substances in them. Very seldom will you ever find pure water in nature. All of our water has minerals, it has salt. Um, here in Texas, we have a ton of calcium carbonate in our water and um, we have fluorine in our water, we have chlorine in our water, and all of these other substances that are dissolved. Now these substances are ionic and they are soluble. So when we look at the chlorine in our swimming pool, when we look at the fluorine in our drinking water, this is all contributing to these ions which make our normal water very heavily conductive. But keep in mind that it's not the water that's the electrolyte. It's the ionic compounds that are dissolved within it. Okay. So uh, just remember that pure water does not conduct electricity, but the substances dissolved in it can. So we're going to take a look at our next topic, and that is solubility and rates of solvation. Now, um, very quickly, I want to go over with you a few words that you're going to need to know for this particular um, part of the unit. And that is, these are three words that a lot of people get confused. So please make sure that you know what they are, okay? And that is soluble, insoluble, okay, and solubility. And it may sound like these are all kind of the, talking about the same thing. And I bet that most of you can probably tell me what soluble and insoluble are. Because soluble simply means that it will dissolve, right? That this is a solute that will dissolve in a solvent, right? And insoluble, by contrast, of course, means that it won't dissolve, okay? And solubility is the one that people... Um, mistake often because they think of it as solubility is whether or not something will dissolve and it's not. Solubility is how much of something is going to dissolve. So solubility only applies to something that is soluble. So solubility is how much of a solute, okay, how much of a solute will dissolve. Okay? So it's not whether or not it will, it's how much of it will dissolve. Okay? So uh, soluble is will dissolve, insoluble things won't, solubility is how much of it will dissolve. 
So when we talk about solubility, it's very important that you are able to keep it straight what solubility means. Because we're also going to talk about one last thing, and I'm going to put this in a different color because I want you to make sure that you don't mistake solubility with uh, the rate of solvation. Okay, so if you give me just a second, I'm going to erase these soluble and insoluble because I think that you guys probably will get that part. Um, what I'm concerned with is that you know the difference between solubility and the rate of solvation. So I'm going to put this in a different color. So the rate of solvation, solvation, this is how fast, how fast something will dissolve, okay? Which of course assumes that it's soluble, okay? So in order to have a solubility or a rate of solvation, you must have a soluble solute. You must have something that can dissolve in a solvent. So um, please make sure that you do have those two things straight. Um, we will talk a bit more about this and do a lab on the rate of solvation as well as a lab on the solubility of substances. For now, I really want you to think about um, if you drink iced tea, for example, um, solubility is how much sugar you can put in your tea before you end up with sugar on the bottom of your glass, where the rate of solvation is how fast is that sugar that you put into your tea going to dissolve, okay? So um, remember that if solubility is actually going to be related to how much water you have, okay? So uh, let's take a look at some some more detail on this solubility of course is the is the measurement of the maximum amount of solute that you can dissolve in a given amount of solvent normally we look at about a hundred grams of water because of course if you have more water you can dissolve more of a substance right you might only be able to dissolve a tablespoon of sugar in uh, a glass of tea but if you have a pitcher of tea or a five gallon bucket full of tea, you can put much more sugar in it. And the reason for that is that solubility is all based on um, how many free water molecules you have. Because if you recall back when we talked about the ions, the positive and negative ions um, in like salt, for example, that gets surrounded by water molecules, each one is going to have well, water molecules all around it. Okay. And if you only have 100 grams of water, you have a limited number of water molecules that can surround your ions in the solute. So once you run out of water molecules, you can't put any more of that uh, solute into your solution. So that is basically the introduction to solubility. Uh, we'll talk more about the rates of solvation in our next um, lab.